everyone. I'm Janine Kakmar with PHTV Channel 4 Palos Heights, and we're back with our show all about books. On this show, as you know, we talk about books and writing and authors, and then we have a chance to visit with a special guest. And today I'm excited to have, uh, we have retired executive director of the MWRD, the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, and author Richard Lanyon. Uh, Richard has written three books so far on the, the history of the Chicago waterways, and I'm excited to hear about your, your newest one. So thanks for being with us today, Richard. It's a pleasure to be here. Great, good. But before we get to visit with you, we're going to talk a little bit of, about books. And as you know, I normally we're going to do today's show a bit differently because normally we talk about the new releases coming out. Summer's kind of a quiet month, um, t a few months of, for the publishing industry. So we're going to talk about uh, something else because since it is the f summer has just officially started and it's summer can be a great time to to take um, to start reading you catch up on your reading the long days of summer are perfect for for your binge reading where you read book after a book and uh, getting lost in a series or a location or a setting or with your favorite characters or authors so what I'm going to talk about today is some good candidates for your summer binge reading and to start with, the tales of the Old West are a good place to get started. And we'll, the first, our first candidate is Dodge City, uh, White Earp, Bat Masterson, and the Wickedest City in um, the American West by Tom Clavin. Now this is a nonfiction book that came out last year and uh, starts with, it talks about the Dodge City, Kansas in the late 1870s and 1880s when it was in its heyday. And it started originally, Dodge City originally started as a um, military post. And it was developed and with the rough and ready cow town, with a stockyard and railroads and buffalo hunters and miners, all of those people making money hand over fist, which of course attracted the criminal element. Which brings us to the second focus of the book of the legendary lawman Wyatt Earp and Bat Masterson. Now the author chronicles the personal history of these two men and their friendship and the two legends they, they became and how these two long, young lawmen led the effort to establish the frontier justice and the rule of law on the, on the American West. This real life account of these two legends is, was reviewed as a rip roaring read and the author says, states that by understanding the history of Dodge City is to understand how the West was won. So if you want to continue on the Old West reading binge, you, can, um, you should try out the historical fiction book by Maria Doria, Maria, excuse me, I always confuse her name. It's Mary Doria Russell by the, the book named Doc. She writes about Dr. John Henry Holliday, or Doc Holliday as we know him, who was a trained dentist in the South and he was actually quite an accomplished pianist too. But he suffered from tuberculosis and at the age of 22 he left Atlanta to the west and guess where he ended up? In Dodge City where he meets Wyatt Earp and the other friends that, he, that make him a legend. Uh, he, when he was in Dodge City he opened up a dentist office and he was a professional gambler as well. He made a lot of money playing the game Faro when he met the, the lawman Wyatt Earp and their, their legendary friendship begins and the adventures begin as well. And if you're, if you're going to be reading in the Wild West settings, I'm going to have to recommend that you have to read the Pulitzer Prize winning novel Lonesome Dove by Larry McMurtry. This book came out several years ago and their two main characters, Gus and Call, are the retired Texas Rangers are still two of my favorite uh, characters of all times. This is a book that has been reviewed as the grandest novel ever written about the last definitive wilderness in America. And it does weigh in at 864 pages. It's quite a thick book, but it is loaded with heroes and outlaws and Indians and settlers. And it's actually part of the PBS Great American Read going on right now. So if you're going to get lost in a book, this is a great book to get lost in this summer. And I've got to throw one more book into the Wild West um, era. Um, one recommendation is The News of the World by Paulette Giles. 
Now, she was nominated for a National Book Award for this book, um, and she writes about very two unlikely companions who have to travel 400 miles over the most dangerous territory in the West in the 1870s. And all of these books, they bring these incredible characters to life, very memorable characters alive against the vivid backdrop of the Wild West. So if you're going to, to binge in one place, that's a good place to start. So you can either binge in a setting or you can spend time with your favorite author. And if you've not read anything by Jeanette Walls, I'm gonna, you might be a good place to, to start with her. And to her memoir that came out a couple years ago is something you might have heard of, The Glass Castle, because it was just recently made into a movie starring Brie Larson, Naomi Watts, and Woody Harrelson. She writes about, in her book, she writes about growing up with her three siblings and her drinker-slash-dreamer father and her artistic mother. And this book has been out for several years, been on the bestseller list for many, many years. And, you know, people said, oh, have you read this book? Have you read this book? And I thought, oh, I don't know. I don't know if I need to read another book about a family on hard times. But the author is such an incredible storyteller. She she brings all her characters to life and you end up caring for all of them even with all of their faults she doesn't demonize her family she doesn't idealize her family she just tells it like it is which is, to me is a great sign of, a, of an excellent writer she also wrote two books of fiction half broke horses is one of them and she calls that a true life fiction story which she taught it's a story about her maternal grandmother actually she fictionalizes it and that this woman is a quite an incredible woman. She was, uh, grew up on a ranch in Texas and Arizona, learned to break horses when she was a child. By the age seven, she was breaking horses on ranches. She rode alone by herself 500 miles on a pony to a teaching uh, job. And then she ran a, a huge ranch back in the day when it was very unusual for women to do so and raised her family out there. Uh, one of her daughters was Rosemary, who was the main character of the Glass Castle. And she continues her excellent storytelling with characters in her other book, The Silver Star. This book features a 12-year-old girl named Bean and her 25-year-old sister who take a bus trip across country to relatives that they've never met before. So any time spent with this author, Jeanette Walls, is time well spent, whether it's a, her nonfiction book or her, her fiction books. Another, another good way to binge read is also spending time with a series, a, a character that you know over several books. And one of the first series I'll, I'll mention is the Billy Boyle World War II Mystery Series by James R. Ben. This, is a, this series is set in uh, the realistic background of World War II. And it could actually be considered a historical fiction because it, all of the battles take place, all of the events are real, all the other characters are real as well. But it features the fictional character Billy Boyle, who was a, a former Irish cop in Boston. And after World War II started, he was, became the personal investigator of one of his cousins, who happened to be Dwight D. Eisenhower. And this series is a combination of action and adventure and history and whodunit. And they're, they're not very thick books, or, so you can just work yourself right through one book after another. I think there's about 17 books in that series right now, so that'll keep you busy all summer. Another mystery series, series worthy of binging on is the Russell and Holmes series by Lori R. King. This is um, her first book, The Beekeeper's Apprentice, introduces a 15-year-old Mary Russell, who, when visiting relatives in the English countryside, stumbles across a man who was studying his bees in a beehive. And she, this man, this strange old man, happened to be the retired detective Sherlock Holmes. Now Mary's incredible intelligence and wit and her spirit are a good match for Sherlock Holmes at this point in his life, and he decides to make her his apprentice. And the relationship grows over the 15 books that are in this series, and, but they're all full of intrigue and mystery and a lot of action. So it's a good place to start as well. So whether you binge read on a favorite author or your favorite mystery series or you get lost in the Wild West or you pick up a new book, pick, challenge yourself to pick up a classic, spend time in Russia with War and Peace or Paris with 
Les Miserables, you know, just pick up a book and start reading. With You have lot, all of these long days ahead of you. Fill them up with some new adventure. So we'll, now we'll talk up a little bit about the New York Times bestsellers that are coming out in June and July. We have Florida by Laura Groft. You remember this author from her Fates and Furies that came out a few years ago. This book is actually a collection of short stories um, on the state of Florida who this author had moved to. She was uh, from New Hampshire, I believe. She moved down to the state of Florida because her husband got a new job and she did not like Florida at first, but now she, um, she found a way to really love it. So these stories are some great stories about that. Danielle Steele is out with a new one, Good Fight. Anthony Horowitz is out with his new one, The Word is Murder. And Frederick Bachman, you know this author from The Man Called Uva, who came out several years ago, huge bestseller. This is the sequel to his book that came out last year, Bear Town. The new one is called Us Against You. Another sequel out is by Laura Weisberger. She wrote the book The Devil Wears Prada several years ago, and she's come out with a sequel, When Life Gives You Lululemons. And it's quite a, this is a hot book this summer, so you'll, you might want to try that one as well. Lori R. King, the one we were just talking about with the, Sh the Holmes and Russell series, is out with her new book in that series, The Island of the Mad. And John Conley, his writes, he wrote his uh, new one, The Woman in the Woods, which is a uh, book with starring the thriller, uh, the thriller starring the private eye Charlie Parker. And then Iris Johansson has a new book titled Double Blind. So there you have some ideas for some summer reading and your New York Times bestsellers. And now we have a chance to visit with our special guest. So Richard Blanion, thank you for being so patient and waiting. I was so excited that you were able to, to be with us today because I've, I've worked with you a couple of years back when um, I was writing the history, history book on Palos Park. So I know you've written several books on the history of Chicago and their waterways. But I want to start with you, first of all, with your, your background. With, with the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District. Uh, well, Gene, Gene, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, yes, I'm a retired executive director from the Water Reclamation District. I've been retired now almost eight years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've really enjoyed my retirement because uh, I've taken up the task of writing a, a history, not only above the waterways, but of the Water Reclamation District. And um, I'm a Chicago native, mm -hmm. born on the south side. Oh, yeah? I grew up on the north side. Now I live in Evanston, and okay. uh, I really enjoy the Chicago area. Mm -hmm. Love to be here. And um, um, Can you tell us a little bit about the, the MWRD? I know people hear that, the, the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District. What is that? Well, it's a, um, it's a large public agency. It serves uh, the, almost all of Cook County. It's a separate uh, municipal entity, not connected with the city or the county. Um, and it uh, provides services for wastewater collection and treatment, also called sewage, and um, also stormwater management, um, which of course is a very important topic these days with all the rain we've had. Right, in, uh, what is, what is, what's June. involved with that stormwater management? Why is, why is that needed? Well, it's, it's both the regulatory program uh, having to do with the development and uh, proper uh, design of drainage facilities to uh, prevent future flooding and also to build facilities to reduce flood damages from uh, past development and so forth. So uh, the district has had a, a uh, used to call it a flood control program, and now it's called stormwater management. Uh, going back into the 50s, okay. and uh, we built many facilities uh, to serve uh, the suburban area and also the deep tunnel project to serve the combined sewer areas in the city of Chicago and 50 surrounding suburbs. So it's an it's agency whose um, most of its infrastructure is underground, out huh? of sight, out of mind, so people <laughs> don't think about it, but you know. Uh, uh, you shouldn't take water for granted. Of course, it comes out of the tap. You may not think about where it comes from. And then, of course, when it goes down the drain, you don't think about where it goes. But mm -hmm. uh, the Water Reclamation District is there to take That's care of that for you. That's your job, to think about those yes. things, right? Or what's so, your job? Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, so I remember you were telling us once about, like, when it does rain, like, we've had such a sex excessive rain over the last few weeks. 
um, what it does to the Chicago River when it's rising or something. And, you, and is that something that you monitor? Do I, am I remembering this correctly? Oh, yes. So. I, yes. At one point in my career, I was in charge of the waterway operations and we had to watch the weather and, and keep tabs of the uh, water levels in the system. And then, of course, as the rain hits the ground and flows into the sewers and out into the canals, the water level goes up. and we have to uh, move water out of the system by discharging down at Lockport, which is the terminus of the canal system. And uh, on, a, on occasion with a very large storm, we'll have to release excess flood water to Lake Michigan. We don't like to do that, but mm -hmm. that is the uh, operation of last resort. Now, is, that, was, is this an unusual um, agency um, that to, to be in a city like this, or is, that, is it something that was needed because of how Chicago was built uh, in such low lands and? Well, uh, drainage was always a problem here in Chicago. It's not the place you would want to build a city, but of course other forces came into being, commerce being the principal force here to uh, create a, a metropolis. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the drainage is a topic of my second book, mm -hmm. um, but it was, it was solved and that was the topic of my first book. Um, why the district was formed, how it was formed, and its first big project was building the large canal from Chicago to Lockport to enable reversal of the flow of the river. And that was a very important step at that time. Uh, now, this is the sanitary district you're talking about, your first book? Yes. Okay, so your first book is Building the Canal That Saved Chicago. Right. Mm-hmm. And, um, and you're saying the importance of that canal was? Well, it's to enable a reversal of flow of the river, number one, because mm -hmm. the river was polluting the lake and uh, threatening the water supply. Uh, waterborne disease was rampant here in, Ch in the Chicago area. And, Isn't uh, it the cholera Marta capital at one point? Yes, uh, that was in the middle 1800s, and then it was typhoid in the late 1800s. And Chicago had, of all cities in the world, had one of the highest mortality rates. Mm. Not a good way to sell a city. <laughs> so um, reversing the flow of the river helped that a great deal. And also it provided a better outlet for drainage um, uh, by uh, moving the water away from uh, the city. So uh, instead of it, the river flowing into the lake, you reverse it to flow down state. You flow down to the Illinois River, right? Okay. And what year was that? When did that? That, that was the first big project in 1890, okay. uh, the 1890s. It was started in 1892, completed in 1900. Was that, so that's after the I and M Canal. Oh yes. Yeah. Well, the I and M Canal was opened in 1848, uh, and that was for the purpose of commerce. It was a rather small canal. Mm -hmm. um, but it was large enough to float small boats to move people and goods. Uh, back and forth. Uh, and that's, that's before the railroads, right? It, you know, well, the, the railroads began to come in just after the uh, I&M Canal opened. So the heyday of the I&M Canal was sort of short-lived, mm -hmm. but it, was, uh, it served its purpose for several decades in the mm -hmm. late 1800s. Um, but it wasn't of a sufficient capacity to reverse the flow of the river. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the 1880s, after a huge flood, the uh, city fathers came up with a plan to reverse the flow of the river, and uh, that's what caused the creation of the sanitary district. Okay. They needed some new agency to take on this big job, and uh, I talk about that in my first book. And that's different from the MWRD, that, the sanitary no, district? That is no, the same it's the thing. same agency. Okay. The sanitary district of Chicago was its original name. It then became the uh, Metropolitan Sanitary District of Greater Chicago in, the, in, 18, in uh, 1955. And then in 1989, it became the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District. They like those long names, Chicago. huh? Yeah. <laughs> but it's the same organization. Okay. And they're, this year, they're 128 years old. Oh, my so gosh. It's, yes, it's been around a long time and a very important yeah. So it was, a very important was, was the reversal of the river a, a, like an a extremely unusual thing, or was that something that had been done before? I mean, to me, that sounds back in the 1890s, that sounds like a, a, quite a feat. It was. It was a world famous project. You know, that was uh, in 1893, we had the Columbian Exposition here in right. Chicago, a World's Fair. 
And people who visited Chicago uh, would take a train ride out and look at this huge project because it was world famous. Hmm. Uh, Chicago is the only city that reversed the flow of the river. And actually, we've reversed the flow of two rivers, the Calumet River being the other one. Okay. Of course. Um, no. But it was very important. And uh, after my first book, you know, I realized I didn't tell the story of drainage. So my second book, I go back into the 1850s uh, when the city began to build sewers. Uh, up until the middle uh, 1855, Chicago had received, uh, attained a population of around four or 5,000. There were no sewers. Oh my gosh. The land was very poorly drained, very marshy. That's why cholera was uh, so rampant. Mm -hmm. And uh, they first began to raise the level of the streets so that you could build sewers because you usually want to put a sewer underground, <laughs> but if you put it underground, it would also be under the river and that's not good for outlet mm -hmm. of the sewer. So that's the first step was to raise the city streets in the downtown area. And then, um, and then to start building sewers. And by the year of the Chicago Fire, 1871, they had a wonderful sewer system. But of course, it was discharging to the river all this raw sewage because mm. sewage treatment technology wasn't available, polluting the river, and the river flowed into the lake. So uh. that had to be solved with the building of the canal in the 1890s. Okay. And that took the water, like you said, to the Illinois River? Yes. And that took it downstate? It, uh, it, well, yes, Chicago sits on, the, on a subcontinental divide. Okay. Runs roughly along Harlem Avenue. Um, to the east, the natural drainage goes to the Great Lakes and out the St. Lawrence River to the Atlantic Ocean. To the west, it goes to the Des Plaines River, to the Illinois River, wow. to the Mississippi, to the okay. Gulf of Mexico, to the Atlantic Ocean. Wow. Thus, okay. you call it a subcontinental divide. Now, if you were to walk across the city as, or drive across the city, you wouldn't notice this divide. That's Not like the Rocky Mountains. Yeah. It's uh, very flat, very subtle. So you like the, the sink, the water in the sink doesn't, or the toilets doesn't flush the other way or whatever. Is that, is, I, I mean, I've heard on the, the continental divide oh. when you, the water will run down the sink in one direction or the other direction, or is that just a fictional thing? I think that's a fictional thing. Okay, never mind. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Back to your book. What's important here is, um, uh, you know, the early settlers realized they could breach this divide and make a, a canal for commerce, and that was the i &M Canal. But then later on it was necessary to breach it again with a larger canal so that they could reverse the flow of the river. Okay. Um, and uh, I talk about that in, uh, early drainage in my second book. And then the second book focuses on the development of the north area and the building of one of the treatment plants up on Howard Street. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, then my third book, um, I get into uh, more detail about some of the modern infrastructure, deep tunnel, and the stormwater management program to serve the, the outlying suburban areas. So your third book, has an interesting title. It's West by Southwest to Stickney, Draining the Central Area of Chicago and Exorcising Clout. That's quite a title. Yes, yes. Uh, and um, West by Southwest is not a takeoff on a Hitchcock movie. Okay, North by Northwest. It has a very specific purpose. Okay. Uh, most of the city, the large central area of the city, is served by a large treatment plant, which is now called the Stickney Water Reclamation Plant. Okay. However, it didn't start out that way. It, the first plant that was built was called the West Side Plant. Okay. And then the district uh, wanted to build another plant across the canal, um, and they were going to call that the Southwest Plant. Well, they ended up building that next to the west side plant. Okay. So we had two plants. And then they combined the two plants into one, they called it the west southwest plant. Wow. And then in, in the late 18, uh, 1980s, they renamed it to the Stickney plant, hence the title West by Southwest to Stickney. <laughs> okay. Then what about the subtitle? It's the... Um... Well, draining the central area was, uh, you know, a large uh, 
and it's carry on of the draining Chicago a bit, but uh, talking about the larger area the, of the city from Fullerton Avenue on the north to 87th Street <coughs> on the south, from the lakefront all the way to the county line, including uh, western suburbs up to the O'Hare Airport. Okay. Um, very huge area, uh, hence a huge plant. All of that flow, all of the sewage in that area flows down to this one plant, the Stickney plant. Uh, now, the other part of that subtitle, Exorcising Clout, right. is about some of the scandals at the district. Scandals uh, in know, Chicago? Really? Why, of course. Unheard uh, of. You won't read this in any official history. Um, the district doesn't like to talk about this, um, only the good things. But I wanted to explain some of this because it's a, it's a rather interesting chapter in, in the history of the district and in the city. Um, I talked about one scandal in my second book that happened up on the north side uh, called The Million Dollar Bridal Path. And in the second book, I talked about this uh, large plant that we had now with, with a lot of people working there and uh, the uh, political forces just kind of ran rampant in the late 1920s, adding more people to the payroll and uh, things just got out of hand. And um, after World War II, uh, there were a series of scandals and uh, it continued through the 50s and then in the 19, early 1960, the Chicago Tribune and several of the uh, do-good organizations like the Better Government Association and the Civic Federation, they began to focus on the district and um, investigate what's going on there. And in 1962, uh, this all got to be such a political problem uh, that something had to be done. Mm -hmm. A reformer was brought in from outside the district and uh, the period of the 1960s was really a reformation for the district and hmm. it ended up with uh, some statutory language to clarify the role of the elected officials versus the role of the staff of mm -hmm. the organization. And uh, that change has survived to this day no to be a, a remarkably well-run uh, governmental organization. So this is something that recovered from the corruption. Um, yes, yes. And of course today with the environmental regulations, uh, you know, its its function is very important and mm -hmm. it has a, an important mission. What are the environmental um, Well, uh, the Clean Water Act. Okay. Uh, we, you know, we need to solve water quality problems. Uh, hence, not only the treatment plants to treat sewage, uh, uh, which began, uh, they began in the 1920s to do that with the technology available. Uh, and then with the Clean Water Act in the 1970s, it was necessary to deal with the combined sewer overflow problem. Okay. And uh, even today, uh, you know, we have stormwater uh, water quality issues. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, I'm sure this, you know, the environment will continue to improve. Uh, what are some, what are there uh, today, like it's today, what are the, are there any threats to, the, to our water sources or the Great Lakes today? Well, I think, the, uh, I, I think in the, you know, the Clean Water Act was designed to deal with the point source pollution, so to speak. Point source being discharges from sewers, from both the municipalities and industries and so forth. And, and the system has worked very well to do that. Now, today we have uh, some emerging pollutants from our personal care products that we use from the pharmaceuticals we take for health like pills and, and uh, also pills the, uh, yeah. uh, compounds that are used in, in household cleaning and, and lawn care and so forth. Mm -hmm. These things are not yet regulated under the Clean Water Act and uh, you know as time goes by today there are very low levels they're not threatening but as time goes by and we use this, more of these, um, they could become a problem. Mm -hmm. So this is something we have to be careful of mm -hmm. in the future mm -hmm. is uh, how we manage our own lives, our own water, and what we put into the water because of our daily Right, uh, we, we don't, so many of us don't think much about it. You know, like you said, we turn the water on, we watch it drain, as long as my drain isn't clogged or my yard isn't flooded, it's really not much we don't think much of the, the what goes on behind the scenes, you know. Right. Um, I'm going to go back to a minute when you're talking about the history of 
of the waterways and so forth. Um, you talk about, in your third, third book, you mentioned the Bubbly Creek, which many of us heard about the Bubbly Creek. It was, um, I want to talk a little bit about that. I thought it was interesting. Well, yes. Um, today, uh, we all call uh, the South Fork uh, the bu Bubbly Creek. Uh, it's, a mi it's about a mile and a quarter long. It extends from about 2700 South Ashland Avenue to almost 39th Street uh, in Racine. However, that was not the original Bubbly Creek. Um, and we're South calling it Bubbly Creek for those who aren't aware, maybe aren't from Chicago. Why was it called the Bubbly Creek? Oh, well, uh, because it bubbled. Why else? What else? <laughs> uh, it, it bubbled because of the fermenting organic matter on the bottom that produced gas, and the gas bubbled up to the surface. From the pollution and all that. Yeah, was, and was it was it made famous by the stockyards, uh, which uh, 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 drained into uh, the, the, the east arm. Now, the that. South Fork that I mentioned earlier, the South Fork had two arms, the east arm and the west arm. The east arm was the outlet for the stockyards drainage. Um, but that, uh, you know, in the 20s, it didn't bubble very much because there was a lot of flow being passed through it. We had a big pumping station down on the lake on the lakefront, and uh, we were diluting the sewage that was flowing into the east arm. The west arm, on the other hand, extended over to Western Avenue, and it ran about a block south of 39th Street in an east-west direction. But it was a dead end. As the south side developed, sewers were built, and they flowed north to the west arm. And uh, once the sewage got into the west arm, it just kind of sat there. Mm. And so that was the original bubbly creek. It really mm. bubbled, and the surface was encrusted over with uh, thick scum. Oh. <clears throat> and um, uh, that was some of the original focus. Eventually, that west arm was filled in, and uh, sewers were built to divert the flow that was going into it. And the same thing eventually happened to the East Arm. So now, Bubbly Creek is this little short section of the South Fork, which... Is it not uh, bubbling anymore, is it? No, it doesn't bubble anymore. It, um, it might bubble after a long dry spell because there are organic sediments on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Okay. And as, the, as we build out the McCook Reservoir and complete the tunnel system, um, the overflows from the Racine Avenue pumping station, which is the only source of flow into Bubbly Creek okay. at 38th and Racine Avenue, um, those will decrease in, in frequency and volume, and Bubbly Creek will bubble less <laughs> and become <clears throat> a more desirable We'll have to call waterway. it a different name then, won't we? Right. <laughs> okay. Um, and that, then you mentioned that you have a fourth book that you're writing, which I'm excited about because being living here in Palos Heights, we're surrounded, or we have our, the major waterway through this town is the CalSAG. Right. <clears throat> right, Janine. And um, uh, the fourth book uh, will deal with the CalSAG and the South area, as, just as the other books have dealt with other areas. So uh, what can I'm you looking... What can you tell us about the history of the CalSAG? Well, I can tell you a lot about that. But first, <laughs> let me tell you, you that I'm, I'm looking forward to this book because, in a way, uh, even though I'm an consider myself a north sider. The south area is sort of somewhat of my favorite area of the, of the three areas of the district. Anyway. Because? Um, well, it, it, uh, it has a, it, an interesting history uh, over in the, uh, uh, the east area around the south end of Lake Michigan. We have the dunes. We have this, uh, we have this amazing e ecological um, system over there that has been um, tarnished by industry, but a lot of it has been uh, restored and brought back. And uh, uh, the south area was also one where the district built the, along with the Cal Sag, they built a sewage treatment plant over near Lake Calumet and a large intercepting sewer system, all as one project. Hmm. And um, although at the time it wasn't planned that way, it developed that way, and it was interesting that in 1922, when the Cal Sag channel went into operation, they had this whole treatment and sewer system behind it already in operation. Hmm. So I, I'm looking forward to tell that, telling that story. Why was the Cal Sag? Now, what was the Cal Sag? Well, 
first of all, where did SAG come from? Many people ask that question. Mm -hmm. SAG is a contraction of Saganashki, which is, a, I guess, an old uh, Native American term. And we have the Saganashki Slough mm -hmm. over here in the Forest Preserve District. So, and the that was uh, known as a SAG Valley. It was kind of a, a low area between two. Uh, higher areas uh, extending east west between Lamont and Blue Island. It was the path of Stony Creek, which is still there, um, <clears throat> although Stony Creek goes north of the village of Worth. The village of Worth sat on what was called Lanes Island, um, and it was the route of one of the feeder canals to the INM Canal, bringing water from the Little Calumet River to provide water for the INM Canal. That was way uh, back then though. That was, yeah. And back then in the, in the, in the early so? 1900s when mm -hmm. the sanitary district wanted to reverse the flow of the Calumet River to remove the threat of pollution from Lake Michigan by that river, the plan was to build a canal and they, rather than go around Lanes Island, they said we're gonna just cut a straight line and uh, that became the Calumet Sag Channel. And that, start, that was started when? That uh, the construction began in 1911, mm -hmm. and it was completed in 1922. Mm -hmm. um, it was delayed because of uh, World War I okay. uh, <clears throat> and the difficulty with labor and materials. Um, and it was, it was supposed to start before 1911, but uh, for various political reasons, it didn't get off the ground. Um, <clears throat> How do they decide, like you said, they decide this doesn't make it right through this area for any reason or? Well, it was the, uh, uh, well, it's the shortest distance between two points. Okay. So a, a, Start know, there. Yeah. that's going to save a few bucks if yeah. have not having a longer canal. And um, uh, that was the principal reason for just making it a, a straight shot. Mm -hmm. it, it was originally built very small because the federal government wouldn't allow a larger canal. They were worried that Chicago was going to take too much water from Lake Michigan. So there was some litigation with the feds over that, and uh, that's part, part of the reason for the delay in construction. Um, but then after it was built, you know, commerce liked this waterway, uh, and it became the main route from... Uh, the Sanitary and Ship Canal to the Calumet area. Rather than go through downtown Chicago, it was a shortcut. But so, so barges were bringing, what, what, what traveled on the Calumet? Yes, that barges, okay. yes. But it was narrow, so uh, it was difficult, you know, to get through. And then <clears> the, right after, um, well, in the late 30s, the federal government, the Corps of Engineers, provided some wider spots during, in the, over the 16-mile length of the canal for the boats could pass. And then after World War II, uh, the Corps of Engineers widened the channel. What year was that? The construction started in about 1955, and it uh, was completed in 1965. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, all the bridges had to be rebuilt because he had a much wider canal. Oh, wow. it, it, was, uh, it was made about four times the width wow. of its original width. That's so quite that a big difference. Yeah, so barges could easily pass each other. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, this larger canal has provided more flood storage capacity okay. for the south area. Um, e but which is a, a good thing. Yeah. You know? So we we discharge we, in a big storm. We don't have to discharge to the lake from the Calumet system mm -hmm. as frequently as we have to do up north. Anyway. Yeah. Now in town, one more question. One in town. Lee Catherine is there, is right against the canal, um, and there were uh, signs there, and I think you had said those signs were old, that the, you're not to let the water touch human contact because of, of the pollution of it. How, what is the quality of the canal, water quality nowadays? Well, the quality today is, is rather good. Uh, in uh, Around the turn of the century, the uh, state of Illinois uh, began a program to uh, upgrade the the uh, regulatory classification of the waterways, and uh, <clears throat> it eventually resulted in the Water Reclamation District uh, providing disinfection of the effluent from the Calumet Sewage Treatment Plant uh, over near Lake Calumet, so that okay. the you know 
the water quality in the Calumet Sake Channel is now swimmable. Oh. If you want to swim in it. Today it is? You can swim it's swimmable. In it. Okay. Um, well, today with the rain runoff, I don't know if you want to swim. But anyway, <laughs> okay. it's, it's... Well, you know, when you get that book out again, Richard, we're going to have to talk some more about that. All right. I look forward to it. Thank you so much for being with Thank you for talking, sharing your books with us today. Thank you, folks, for being with us. And we will see you next time.